Welcome to the U.S. Army Europe podcast. I'm Jesse Granger, and joining us today is the Commanding General of the U.S. Army here in Europe, Lieutenant General Mark Hurley. Thanks for being with us today, sir. It's great to be here, Jesse. Thanks. And good to see you again. I think last time I saw you, we were uh, in Ukraine on the training ground there, uh, checking out some of the airborne operations. And before that, I think we were in Croatia and Serbia and a couple other places. So we've been bumping each other everywhere but in Heidelberg. So um, I, I know you've got a tight schedule, so I want to get right into it. First off, uh, you took command here in U.S. Army Europe uh, around the beginning of the year. Now that the year is more than half over, I just wanted to get your kind of first impressions of the command over here and how you feel about the role that soldiers here in Europe play in the overall grand defense scheme of things. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we, we arrived here uh, about the late March period, so Sue and I have been here about four months now. A little over four and what I've seen as we've traveled around first of all is uh, the soldiers uh, continue to do the nation's business I mean right now we have about 30 percent of US Army Europe deployed uh, two full brigades plus elements of uh, uh, combat aviation brigade some engineers some MPs so I mean we still after 10 years of war have continued to provide a forward stationing uh, pod for further forward stationing. Uh, and I think the, the training aspect of getting those soldiers ready specifically for Afghanistan with the great facilities we have at JMTC is ongoing and it continues to be the best uh, anywhere I've seen it in the Army. So the whole preparing of U.S. Army forces for combat continues to go on. Even as we start to shift focus a little bit to, uh, to full spectrum operations and full spectrum training events as they're now being called, FSTEs. Um, I think what makes ours, our potential for doing those full spectrum training events uh, a little bit better than the rest of the Army is because of our second element of our line of operation, which is training with partners and training with allies. Uh, as you just mentioned, we had in Ukraine last week 13 different allied nations coming together with about 1,400 soldiers uh, doing things together. Some uh, counterinsurgency oriented like clearing rooms or uh, doing checkpoints or working with populations. Others, uh, full spectrum kind of stuff. Uh, uh, parachute drops, uh, uh, attacks across open ground, things like that. So I think the combination of training our forces for combat plus working with partners uh, has been phenomenal. And that not only goes on in other countries, but also goes on significantly at the Joint Multinational Training Command. Um, the thing that I think, having been away from here for two years uh, after I left in 2009 and then coming back, seeing how further our European partners uh, have continued to develop. Uh, they, they are standing up very good armies. They are transforming and evolving their armies uh, to meet the standards of not only NATO, but the kind of operations uh, our partners have to do in homeland security, but also uh, coalition operations. So I've been very pleased by coming back um, and seeing, as an example, the Polish forces or the Romanian forces, or the Georgian battalions. Uh, when I left the G3 job here in 2007 before taking 1st Armored Division, the Georgians were just beginning to evolve into a level of competency where they could deploy and fight. Now they've just, as an example, uh, doubled, doubled down on their commitment to ISAF. So instead of one battalion, they're going to provide two. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, what U.S. Army Europe is doing. In the Georgians' case, they also have the Marines helping out there, but that's primarily a JMTC and a 21st TSC operation. Uh, we outnumber the Marines that are training uh, by a significant number. Um, and, and then I guess the final piece, if you're talking about all of our lines of operation, training forces, working with allies, building partner capacity, and then the last thing I've seen since coming back is some of the construction and the rebasing and, and uh, the consolidation that we started in, uh, here in Europe in 2002 is almost at completion, almost there. We're at about 80% complete. Uh, and the construction, the, the consolidation at, at some key posts is all relatively on track. There's been a couple of delays, but I think our facilities are phenomenal. Uh, you, you go, as an example, to what I think is our best facility, the housing area at Netzkeberg down by Grafenbeer. 
and you see brand new houses, uh, brand new community centers, schools, and people who are extremely happy with not only the stationing at our training center, but also the housing there. So the mission and the quality of life is good. Um, all right, so uh, I, I have with me a, a copy of today's uh, Stars and Stripes. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, you're pretty uh, prominently featured on the cover there. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's got an article about kind of the, the cost of having forces over here and some of the benefits that you've been able to see of continuing the Army's presence over here in Europe. So uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, what do you say to the folks back home who, who would say, who have seen these, these cuts that the government has had to make recently and say, you know, the mm -hmm. Cold War is over, let's get our guys back home and save some money. How do you respond to that? Well, I'd say first of all, yes, the Cold War is over, but U.S. Army Europe hasn't been fighting the Cold War since 1990. I mean, we've been doing other things, primarily uh, serving in all the hot spots that some people tend to forget about that have occurred not only in Europe, but also in Africa. I mean, we've been in Kosovo, in Rwanda, uh, in, in Liberia, in North Africa, in uh, the Balkans. Uh, we've stood by in, in some of the other troubled spots and provided significant um, contributions on very short notice. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that in just a second. But all during that time also, while people think that we're over here fighting the Cold War, we've been very close to the key fights of Iraq and Afghanistan. I think some people have forgotten that we we bring Afghan National Armies to train with us at, at, at Grafenbeer and Hohenfels. We have in the past, when, when the Iraqi uh, operation was, was at its height, we were bringing Iraqi generals and Iraqi soldiers here to help train our forces. We were sending our trainers to the active theaters in Southwest Asia. So I think some people tend to forget those kind of things that have been going on and the, the value of having USER very, very close to current fights as well as assuring our allies uh, that we're here. Um, as, I, as I think was mentioned in the newspaper article by Nancy Montgomery, uh, we have several of our allied friends, some that are new members of NATO, who still have some, some fears of their own security of their countries and as I said in the article rightfully so in some cases because they've experienced some actions by others so just having them tell me uh, that they are they are very happy about the presence of US forces to assure their security is critical and then over and above that I think from just a strategic aspect uh, we haven't fought the Cold War what we have done is provided about 40,000 or elements of 40,000 soldiers a year to Afghanistan as part of ISAF. 87% uh, of the forces contributing, or 87% of the countries contributing forces to ISAF have been from Europe. So our strategic partnership with European allies has been critical in the fight, and I think some people uh, tend to forget that. Those, those partners uh, that are contributing to the fight in Afghanistan, close to one-third of the total soldier population in Afghanistan, come from Europe. And the majority of those have trained with U.S. Army Europe to prepare them for it. I had a conversation with uh, General Petraeus about a month ago on a VTC, and I asked him bluntly, I said, hey, sir, uh, what, what can U.S. Army Europe do to better uh, prepare forces for ISAF? Uh, both omelets and pomlets, the operational maneuver liaison teams and the police um, uh, liaison teams, as well as the European forces that are going in there. And, and what he said to me is he said, hey, Mark, uh, the, the forces that USERER is contributing uh, to the fight or helping train are doing just fine over here. It's sometimes the other nations that don't have a mentor or a training relationship with a U.S. force don't understand coalition operations as much. So I think, you know, the old ISAF commander, General Petraeus, uh, even though he's out of the job now, would readily admit the fact that USER contributed significantly to the quality and, and capability of the ISAF force. So that's how I would answer all those who say that USER is still fighting the Cold War. We haven't fought it in 20 years. Uh, they need to understand that. We are actually, in my view, leaning very forward uh, to the kinds of threats and strategic conditions we might have in the future. And, and all those soldiers that you're able to train here replace what, what would have been U.S. soldiers downrange. Well, yeah, that's exactly the point I, I made. I tried to make in the, uh, in the 
Stars and Stripes article that of the 140,000 soldiers in Afghanistan right now, 40,000 of them are from Europe. And what, and, and I'm talking allied, not U.S. Army Europe, but allied partners. So had they not ponied up, had they not trained uh, with us, had we not collectively uh, improved competence, uh, and not only us improving them, but us, uh, them improving us, um, then those 40,000 European soldiers would have been probably replaced with 40,000 U.S. soldiers. And by my count, that's about eight brigades worth of forces, and we can't afford to do that. Uh, you know, Jesse, it, it's an intellectual argument. And when, when you can sit down with the people who are saying, what do we need forces in Europe for, and kind of explain those numbers, uh, I think they begin to see it. Uh, I think when people visit us over here, they see it. Uh, they get it. Uh, you know, we're, we're working very closely. Uh, there, are, there are 51 countries that we consider part of UCOM's area of operation. We connect with about 45 of those, and we work very closely with about 31 or 32 of those. That's pretty significant in terms of generating forces uh, and being a part of either NATO or an alliance. And you yourself have been uh, pretty eager to get out there and, and spread the word. Is that an argument that you en enjoy making? It, it is an argument I enjoy making because I think it, it is more of a security strategy as opposed to a budget or a placement strategy. You know, there, over the last couple of years in both Iraq and Afghanistan, there have been many who have said, hey, we've got to cr decrease numbers. We've got to draw down the force. We've got to do this. We've got to take away brigades or battalions. And from a military perspective, the argument I make is that's not strategy, that's just budgeteering. Uh, you know, just the count or the amount of people that are there don't make the national security policy work. What makes it work is what is the objective? What are we trying to do? And, and the argument I make for Europe is we are trying to build partner capacity, we are trying to conduct theater security cooperation, and we're staying close to those who contribute. So that's a pretty strong value for the amount of, of dollars that are allocated to U.S. Army in Europe. Okay, so you came to us from uh, initial military training. I did. And um, you were at the forefront of some of the, uh, some significant changes to the way we uh, feed and train our soldiers. Um, can you talk a little bit about the programs that developed there and, and what programs uh, soldiers over here in Europe can start to expect to see? Yeah, well, uh, that was, a, first of all, a great assignment. And I didn't expect it to be a great assignment. I didn't know what to expect when they told me I was going there. Uh, but General Dempsey gave me some pretty good verbal guidance and said, go, he, he, his guidance to me was basically, hey, I'm not sure exactly what's wrong, but I'm not getting a good feeling for what we're doing in basic training, AIT, lieutenant training, Bullock. He said, go out and take a look and then do whatever you want to do. I mean, that was his guidance, literally. Uh, it took about five minutes. I said, Roger, sir, uh, and I'm out of here. And, it, and I think as a cavalryman talking to another cavalryman, we understood each other. So the, the first thing I looked at when we were there is, what were we teaching? And we found out that in a, as an example, in a 10-week basic training course, uh, we, were, we were teaching an awful lot of stuff. And, you know, when you try and shove a lot of stuff into in the anybody's brain over a short period of time, you don't pick up all of it. So I started asking some questions, what, what sorts of things are we training? And what I found out was, as folks began to lay it out to me, we were doing a lot of PowerPoint classes. We were doing a lot of things that had nothing to do with what young soldiers needed to know. And we were teaching a lot of hours. In fact, um, I asked for the program of instruction, the proverbial POI of what we were teaching in basic training, and I found that we had 793 hours worth of instruction on different things. And what's fascinating for that, if you, if you take a look at a 10-week POI and you see how much time you need to sleep and to eat and to do PT, and then you do the math, you find out you only have about 660 hours available to teach. So the question is, what weren't we teaching? And what were we saying we were doing versus what we weren't doing? So we had a couple of sessions, and we relooked uh, the the famous warrior task and battle drills, which 
you know, people were saying we were expert in, and in fact, we weren't because we didn't, in some cases, even know what they were. Uh, and I'd challenge anybody, and I've been in many forums where I've said, okay, name a couple of them for me, and people can't do it. Even though we say we're proficient in it, we don't even know what they are. So we started necking those down a little bit. And the whole intent uh, was to do less things, but do them better. Uh, and really focus on the basics of soldiering in basic training. Uh, and then when a soldier got to his or her first unit of assignment, uh, they reported as no kidding a tradesman, uh, or I'm sorry, as an apprentice, and then the unit based on their mission would turn them into a tradesman or a journeyman. And it, it, it was interesting, yesterday I was in Israel and I was having a conversation with the chief of the Israeli uh, ground forces, the Israeli army, and he basically said the Israeli army went through the same thing, that they were just teaching too much stuff. And one of his colonels used an expression to me. He said, you know, it was like, it was like a glass, you know, a person can only hold so much in a glass of water. You can try and pour more water into it, but it just overflows and you can't hold on to it. And he said, that's what we were doing in our army by trying to teach too many skills. So we related back to the basics. And I said, wow, interesting you're saying that because that's exactly what we try to do in initial military training. So that was the skills piece of it. And then there were the values piece. You know, one of the things that make, you know, one of the areas that contributes to our army being a profession, by definition, is a set of shared values. Uh, and yet you would go up and, and you'd say to drill sergeants, okay, we're getting these kids off the streets of America how are we teaching them our values? And I really didn't get a whole lot of comfort with the answers I was getting. You know, it was like, oh, sir, we talk about war stories on the way to the range, or we do this, or we do that. And I said, well, that's not really the so-called standards that I'm looking for that the Army is famous for. How do we train values? How do we train the Army values? So we put a lot of attention on that. And interestingly enough, you've probably seen some reflection of that here in what I'm doing. Because you know we train the values in combat in, in basic combat training, but then we don't talk about them a whole lot afterwards. And the values are truly the base of our profession. So Sergeant Major Capel and I are, are really focusing on on uh, you know what the seven Army values are, what they mean, how they contribute to discipline and fitness and and character, and we're trying to reinstitute a conversation about them within our ranks because that's what contributes to being a professional. And, and then the last thing that everybody's interested in is the physical uh, component of what we are training in basic training. Uh, we did, uh, as a collective group, start changing the way we were training, uh, we were conducting physical training. Because frankly, we were rolling our own across the board. Uh, each individual training camp was sort of doing their own thing and a lot of our drill sergeants were saying hey you know I've got these kids that aren't in good shape so I'm gonna keep working them out until you know they're in shape well the result of that kind of mentality is is not soldiers that are in better shape what results from that usually is soldiers that are broken uh, because they're overworked so we developed a very scientific program uh, for physical readiness training that's part of the new manual a guy named Frank Palkowska at the Army's Fitness School had been wanting to do this for several years, but no one had, had supported him in the idea. Well, he and I are uh, old friends from when we both taught in the physical education department at West Point, so I gave him free reign and he did it and created a terrific program that is now beginning to catch fire in the rest of the Army. And as people do it, uh, they begin to see how valuable it is. If they don't do it, they're all saying, oh, that's that new stuff and let's go do P90X or Insanity instead. When I'm saying, hey, try our stuff and you'll see that it's more scientifically based and provides a better, uh, better trained soldier. Also linked to that was the nutritional aspect uh, and the fueling the soldier initiative, which here in Europe has turned into fueling the teams. Uh, because in basic training, it's fueling the individual soldier, getting them better nutrition helping them perform like a tactical athlete. Uh, if you can transition that from the individual soldier to the squad, to the platoon, to the company, you're, you're really fueling the teams and making sure they get the right kind of nutrition to perform their mission in combat. So on values, um, obviously you've made it a, a, a pretty uh, a big priority here. It's been one of your initiatives to, to get the word out about values uh, across the U.S. Army and Europe. 
and I, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, why now? Why, why reemphasize this stuff now? And, and why is it so important to you? Well, it, I think it's important for all of our Army, not just here in Europe. Uh, and General Dempsey, our chief, has asked us to do it. Uh, not specifically the values, but what General Dempsey has asked us to do is to focus on the profession. Uh, reframing the fundamentals of a profession. Well, if you, if you break down the definition of what a profession is, a profession is something that exists to contribute a certain skill set. That's easy to determine in the military. We fight and defend our nation, we win our wars. That's our skill set. So everything that contributes to that are our skills. But an all, another definition of a profession is we are like-minded in terms of a, a, a specific ethic. Uh, we have a code. Uh, the warrior's uh, creed is that code for us. And every profession, whether it be a lawyer, a doctor, uh, a minister, uh, or a soldier has a prescribed set of values. Our profession has that. So we just have to get back to it as the base. Uh, so you can see where all these things fit together in terms of being a professional. The Warrior's Creed, refocus on that. Values as a base. Uh, reframing the fundamentals of our competency, the warrior task and drills and the way we train, all contributing to who we are and what we do. You know, somebody, I heard somebody once say that just because you say you're a professional doesn't mean you are one. You have to really kind of investigate those certain aspects of it and say to yourself, what am I doing with regard to that? In, in the profession of arms, in being a soldier, you know, we've defined what our values are. The, the whole leadership acronym, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. You can apply those not only to the battlefield, but how you perform when you take the uniform off, who you are, what you do, and, and it really does separate us from the rest of society. You know, the rest of society doesn't hold those values true. They may talk about them in eaches, but we're saying, hey, if you're putting on the uniform, if you're a soldier, then you adhere to those values whether you're in combat or out of combat or drinking a beer or downtown or with your family, you know, those seven army values are critically important. Now that you've, uh, you've been here for a little while and uh, you've got the lay of the land. Um, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I, I yeah. want to get your take on, uh, you know, some of the challenges that, that USER is facing coming up. I mean, between the recent reduction of forces over here and the upcoming uh, move of the headquarters to Wiesbaden, um, what do you think the outlook is for the U.S. Army in Europe uh, in the long term? That's a hard question because right now, uh, as the announcements have been made, as I've said to several people, I think the final force posture announcements, what we're going to be left here with, the three combat brigades, the aviation brigades, the support infrastructure with the 21st TSC and the fist signal and the, and the medical, I mean, those, are, those things are set. There will be some additional changes that we will generate to gain efficiencies and effectiveness. Um, but, but frankly, I mean, I, I, I'm, I have to be candid and say, with some of the budget constraints and what we're seeing in terms of the national debate on the economy, I'm not sure what will happen next. Um, you know, we've had some back and forth with Department of the Army. Uh, with what we think might happen in terms of budget decrements. Uh, we've had some back and forth in terms of what we think might happen in terms of personnel decrements, both soldiers and civilians. Uh, so there is the potential for future changes. Uh, I hope they're not that significant, but, but I promise everybody who's ever listening to this, there will be changes and we'll have to address them, uh, both in, in budget constraints and fiscal responsibility and steward ship of our resources as well as who we hire and who we have to ask to leave. That will happen. I just don't know the extent of it yet. But that's all short term. In the long term, what I might suggest is I'm not sure what's going to happen. We have an announcement that, that sets the conditions for 2015. Uh, could those conditions change? Maybe. They might. Uh, but if they do, we'll have to address them as they come. I, I'm hoping we can 
persevere in the argument that U.S. Army Europe and UCOM combined are important to the security strategy of the United States. But, you know, ours is to make the argument. It's up to other people to make the decision. And I'm sure there are other things that will influence those decisions. So we'll just try and continue to make a strong argument that way. And now, having said all that, how do you personally feel to be leading this command into a new era? I, I said the other night that this job for me is a dream come true. And my wife stopped me and she said, no, it's not because you never dreamed that this would happen. And she's right on that. I mean, this, this is really uh, being, uh, having the honor of leading U.S. Army Europe uh, at this time is, you know, with, with a lot of things going on is, first of all, it is an honor, like I said, it's a privilege to serve, uh, but it's also challenging. It, it certainly stretches uh, not only my imagination, but everybody else's imagination and initiative on how we, we address some of the challenges and make sure we provide as much of an even keel as we can for the forces that are assigned here and that are training to do our nation's work. Um, the bottom line, I couldn't think of a better job to have. And I'm serious when I say this, I hope I stay here for a very long time, uh, forever if possible. Uh, th this is really, you know, U.S. Army Europe uh, has been a place where Sue and I have raised our family. Uh, we've, of the 36 years I have in military service, we've spent 11 years over here. Uh, our kids grew up here. I've trained at every rank from lieutenant to major to brigadier general to two-star general now here as a three-star. Uh, I've deployed out of here three different times with forces, all first armored division, so I'm very proud of having been with first armored division three times and deploying out of here. Um, and, and I just love working with the European community, especially the Germans, uh, but all of the European community now. And the quality of life over here is, I think, the best anywhere in our service. So how much better can it get? And, and the beer is pretty good, too, from what I've heard. That's what I read, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so lastly, um, you've had the chance to travel around and uh, see some of the moving parts that make up U.S. Army Europe for yourself. And I, I just wanted to ask is, what is it that you've seen and what stands out to you as uh, a story you like to share about the soldiers over here and, and what they do? Huh. Uh, Jesse, every day is a new story. Uh, I, I mean, perfect example today, I mean, just before this, I had the opportunity to go with Sergeant Major Capel to the, uh, to the uh, Best Warrior competition to choose both the soldier and the NCO that are going to represent U.S. Army Europe uh, in the Army competition. There were 16 uh, soldiers and NCOs that competed in this thing. And I got to tell you, the, the focus on values, the focus on pushing their own uh, personal envelopes, uh, achieving things that they never thought they would have achieved, and not only that, uh, but the support of their sponsors uh, and their, their spouses was just phenomenal. Having uh, sat at a table with a spouse of a soldier and uh, them only having been married for a year and she's telling us and she's a German a German wife who was telling about how she was married to this soldier and didn't realize what she was getting into and now she loves it uh, and how much she supported him during this competition was pretty cool. Um, yesterday uh, in Israel meeting with not only our Israeli counterparts and understanding their situation in that country but also uh, the, the members of our embassy and our, our, our defense attaches, the military folks who are there supporting that. And that occurs in every single one of our country, you know, meeting the ambassadors, the country teams, the soldiers that are assigned to embassies and trying to help other countries. I mean, each one of those is a great story. Uh, seeing forces train at Grafenbeer, you know, watching uh, U.S. Army soldiers as diplomats training Bulgarians or Romanians or Georgians when they appear at our training center uh, and understanding that that's not something that occurs at Fort Bragg or Fort Hood. That only happens here where you have to work through the languages and work through the cultures and at the same time get the training element. Uh, so you're not only training the other country, 
but you're professionally developing yourself and broadening your own views. Um, the families have been significant to me uh, and the amount of support that they give our soldiers. Uh, I, had, I had a Facebook exchange with a, a young six-year-old from Graffenbure the other day who I hope we can pull into this TV commercial. Her, her name was Abigail and, and she asked me a simple question on Facebook. Uh, is it fun to be a girl soldier? And, and I answered, I said, I, I don't know if it is or not because I'm not one, but, but I'm, certainly there, I'm certain there's a few of them that can give you that answer. Uh, but to have you know, a young child who's the, the daughter of one of our soldiers say something like that is pretty cool. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I just get to see uh, smatterings of these as I, I, I go around. You know, right now we have 42,000 soldiers and about the same amount of civilians assigned to U.S. Army Europe and then about another 100,000 family members. There are hundreds and thousands of stories every day that occur. And I'd like to believe that most of them are good, although I know some bad things happen every once in a while that we have to reach out and try and fix. But I think just the combination of how we care for each other over here with how we train and how we broaden our horizons are all good things about being here. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have, sir. Thanks so much again for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for being here, Jesse. You're, you're doing some great things and telling the U.S. Army Europe story, so keep it up and do more of it. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> it. Okay. And if you'd like to join the conversation online, remember you can always reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search U.S. Army Europe. And until next time, I'm Jesse Granger. Thanks for downloading.